Hey boys and girls, welcome to Mineral Live. This is a little different kind of a show. It's more or less just uh, me and my associate here, Al Wagner. Al and I have known each other forever. And um, Al's been uh, always several, <laughs> several stations higher in life than I was. Um, he was an executive at a, a variety of different places. I'll let him talk a little bit about that. But uh, we thought, you know, really and truly, we're into an age of um, real innovation, real revolutionary kinds of things happening. And I thought it might be a good idea if maybe Al and I had a chance to recant a little bit, because Al's big into history, a, a little bit about what, um, what's happened or what's happening and how it relates to what happened in the past. Uh, what's old is new. It's always the same thing, and history repeats itself. It's another cliche, but really and truly, it really does come around over and over again, and it's usually about a century uh, between between these extraordinary uh, new developments. So, Al, thank you for coming, and uh, could you possibly give us a little sure, background? Sure, I'll, I'll do the best I can. Hey, Sandy, thanks, uh, thanks for having me, first of all. I appreciate wow. it. And, um, you know, my name is Al Wagner and Sandy. We've known each other for 100 years at least. Um, <laughs> kind of embarrassing when you talk about how long you've known a lot of people. But uh, my current position right now is I'm executive director at Hyundai Transis. I'm the seat division for North America. Been there for about four years. I don't want to uh, talk too much about myself because this is really about the uh, the history of the auto industry and where we're headed and, uh, and stimulate some interest in, in history. Prior to that, I was uh, a vice president of um, product development for Mercedes-Benz Tech. I was also the uh, vice president of Celine uh, and president of Celine Electric. Uh, spent 10 years at Lear. And uh, let's see. So in other words, you just couldn't keep a steady I, I job. I couldn't keep a steady job. <laughs> yeah. but, but, but I did stay at Lear for 10 years and had a great time there, a great company. And uh, prior to that, I was uh, at a company called Entech. Some of the folks will probably remember Entech. I was there for 15 years and ended, uh, ended up being the executive vice president there over the 15-year period of time. In that period of time, I, I, I think you know this, Sandy, but I owned a small kit car company out in Chula Vista, California in the mid I'm sorry, the late 80s, and uh, made uh, bodies and uh, uh, for the Daytona Spider that was on uh, my yeah. device and some of the race cars out there in California. But I've had a great career. I'm, I'm just, um, uh, just tickled pink to be part of uh, the automotive uh, world. Uh, it's, uh, it's been a, a great ride so far, and um, I was kind of bored into it. My dad was an engineer at Chrysler. Actually, started at Briggs Body in 1953. I think we're going to talk a little bit about that later on. But mm. that's it. That's the thumbnail. <clears throat> and I'm looking forward to chatting and uh, talking a little bit about where we're headed. So. Yeah, so I think that before we head down the path of where we're heading, it'd be a great idea if we talked about what happened, um, say, about 100 years ago with um, horses and buggies versus the newfangled horseless carriage and uh, the EV versus ICE vehicle in those days and whatnot. Um, I think that it's kind of amazing. Uh, you, you told me that we had um, in around 1912 or something like that, there was 500 EV companies or 500 car companies. Yeah, the, um, uh, the, the, the records show that somewhere around 500 plus EV companies were uh, manufacturing uh, electric vehicles from about 1910 through uh, the early 40s, actually. Uh, and there was a, an interesting uh, thing that was going on back then because we had steam vehicles as well. And about the turn of the century, and it kind of parallels what we're talking about today, is that, you know, we're, we're trying to essentially figure out what the next um, best uh, mode of, uh, of, of transportation is in terms of uh, um, a propulsion. Well, as a matter of fact, in 1912, uh, we, I believe that we, we outsold um, IC cars, electric cars outsold uh, internal combustion engines nearly four to one. Mm -hmm. And it was because of the fact that they were very, very simple 
um, <clears throat> and easy to operate. Most women drove um, electric vehicles back. Well, then. who's going to try and crank it? I mean, even uh, when I when I turned over uh, uh, a Model T, I can't remember how long ago it was, and that damn thing backfired. I thought it was going to tear my arm off. Oh, my yeah. the, my yeah. uh, forearm swelled up like there was no tomorrow. Yeah. And quite frankly, when I did that, I was in <laughs> I was a lot younger and way better shape. And I can't even imagine what that would be like if uh, if a woman was going to give that or somebody who somebody my age now getting that and and uh, whack. I mean, that'd be it. Where's my where's my EV? I'd be I'd be looking at that right away. Yeah. So and <clears throat> along those same lines is um, and then we'll talk about the parallelism of where we are today. So um, the, the internal combustion engine, by the way, I just wanted to say a couple things before we get into a little bit more detail on the history is that what I'm hoping to do here is to stimulate a, a interest in automotive history because I have to tell you something, it is probably one of the most fascinating, fascinating areas of history that, that one could indulge himself in. And we're in Detroit and there's so many people that are part of the auto industry but yet they don't know where I, what the rear view mirror looks like. Mm. And, if, and there's a, a, a lot of data out there, a lot of great books to read. Um, and, and it is just absolutely fascinating to me. And the characters that are involved in, in the automotive history are just phenomenal, yeah. absolutely phenomenal. Well, you know, uh, based on, on what you just said there, I'm going to inject uh, a couple of uh, pictures. So mm -hmm. uh, we'll pop up this first picture right now. And, um, and in that first picture, I want you to see if you can find <clears throat> the car, okay? So you're gonna see a lot of horse-drawn carriages. I want you to see if you can find the car in that picture. Now it'll circle, boom. So now we can move to the next one. This is, 10 years later, I want you to see if you can find the horse. In 10 years, New York City changed from horses to even the cars that were tough to, to crank and turn over uh, or EVs or whatever. It doesn't matter. That horse, that one guy with a horse was basically being pushed right out of existence in 10 years. And now we're looking at 10 years from, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the next five years, basically, as saying there's going to be a lot, of, a lot of people that are going to be unhappy if they bet on the wrong product. And the horse, in the olden days, that was a bad idea. And now I'm thinking that the ICE vehicle is a bad idea. Yeah. Yeah, I, you know, that's an interesting comment, uh, uh, Sandy. When, when you talk about the inter internal combustion engine, I, I kind of look at what happened in 1929 as an example. It was the Great Depression, right? Uh, what happened with uh, the, the Pierce, uh, Pierce Arrow, um, Peerless, and also with respect to um, a Packard even. Packard was, yeah. Uh, it was the, the number one selling um, luxury brand on the face of the planet at that time. And over the course of a couple of years, that became extremely out of vogue in terms of being yeah. dr driving a very, very expensive and elaborate car. So it's almost the parallelism there that we have is that um, the, the ICE vehicle is almost out of vogue in, in, in certain areas of the country right now. And that it, it, it puts me in mind of the fact of what happened with the, the very luxurious vehicles. You know, people were throwing eggs and stones at these guys driving yeah, Packards yeah. back then. And it took about 10 years to get that back. And then Packard went, it wasn't very long before Packard had uh, hit their demise. Yeah. Um, you know, it was 1957 or 1956, if my memory serves me right. But there was a, a whole series of things that happened after that where uh, they simply made some pretty pretty rough moves in terms of what their product line had to look like. Well, the engine itself, they used a, a World War II tank engine or something. Yeah. It was, uh, it was not, uh, not terribly efficient, smoked, and I mean, there was, a, and didn't Cadillac also use that engine? Well, Cadillac was, similar? it's a great, great point because that was <clears> one <throat> of the part of the, the demise of, for lack of a better way to put it, was that 
Cadillac um, came out with the automatic transmission, um, which is essentially a, a derivative of the hydromatic. Um, yeah. And then they, and, and Cadillac had a V8, and that was the trend of the day because they were much more efficient, they were smooth, and, and our friends at Packard continued on with the straight A. Straight A, yeah. 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 And that was, you know, a, a, another bl like blunder, for lack of a better put, mm -hmm. way to put it, on, 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 uh, on the behalf yeah. of uh, Packard. Well, one thing that people don't know, um, or many people don't know, is that the reason the ICE vehicle took over wasn't because people wanted to pump gas or anything like that. It was because of a guy named Boss Kettering. Um, the university is named after him. And, um, and uh, Kettering invented the electric starter. And with the electric starter, anybody could get it moving, and the ICE vehicle was cheaper. It was way cheaper than, a, than a, an electric vehicle. It stunk and things like that, but, but it was way cheaper. Now, you also mentioned something about, you know, throwing rocks at Packers and things like that. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> mostly that was people, younger people who were out of work. And they looked at these bourgeois that, uh, that, that had these fancy cars that they could drive around. And these guys couldn't afford the... Uh, the valve stems for the tires right so this is kind of happening in a little different way right now so um uh, i drove the the um i drove the uh, the tesla model 3 in this morning and one of my guys said hey you know what um my son aiden really wants to uh wants to ride inside of a tesla and i said well take it because my wife's got the uh the jeep and uh so said, take the, uh, take the Tesla and let him do whatever he wants to do. Now, I don't know exactly how old Aiden is, but I'm guessing he's around 12 or 13. In five years, 18. What kind of car is he going to go for? He knows everything about that car. When I gave him the key to the car, the, the key to the Tesla, it's not a key. It looks like a, it looks like a credit card. The kid instantly went over, unlocked the doors, went and sat in the car on the passenger side, put the key card where it's supposed to be underneath the uh, shelf, and his dad, Bill, had no clue what to do. And I said, well, you know, you go reverse, uh, put your foot on the brake, and then push up on, right. the, uh, on, the, on the column stick, and then when you want to go forward, push down on it. And, um, and um, Aiden said something quietly, and I think what it was was everybody knows that. Well, Bill didn't. <laughs> and, and I'm telling you what, yeah. this is where the demise of the automotive companies are all going to be. They think that five years is okay. We'll just get there in five years. Guess what? That kid's going to be 18. He's already got a locked-in impression. And that locked-in impression is not going to be going to a stinky gas station. It's not going to have anything to do with polluting the atmosphere and killing all the polar bears on the planet. It's not going to have anything to do with that. And he is not going to be wanting to get into a car that's going to make a lot of noise. In he fact, uh, Kim, my, uh, my wonderful secretary, she uh, just bought a, a new car. And she said, I love everything, but it's too noisy. Isn't that so? And there you go. Yeah. So... People are moved, just like they moved away from the, uh, the electric vehicles because of the convenience associated mm -hmm. with, and it was cheap <clears throat> to, to run an ICE vehicle in the early teens of the last century. That's, that's kind of like how that happened. And then you saw the paradigm change, go from horses to cars. But then you see the next paradigm change where because of, the situation, young people despise people who are running around in, in these big luxurious vehicles. And now what I'm looking at is dad may uh, like, uh, like the roar of the engine and stuff like that. Mom doesn't, neither do the kids. So they're all gonna go quietly and they're gonna go and get something else. And that's what I think is gonna really be the differentiator. And I think there's uh, probably a whole bunch of exec automotive executives that should be listening to the kids in, um, in grade school. Those, those kids in grade eight or grade nine, yeah. 
talking to them about, well, what do you think? What are you going to have when you get when you uh, in three years? And I'm telling you, the word Tesla is right on the tip of their tongues. It's funny you should mention that because uh, if you if you're to talk to the younger folks right now, um, everybody knows who Elon Musk is, and everybody, all the young people, I have uh, nieces and nephews, and uh, they know who Elon is. They know a lot about Tesla, and we're talking kids that are eight, ten, twelve, fifteen years old, but they don't know what a Plymouth is. And, <laughs> and there's probably two people in this room right now that don't well, know what a Plymouth yeah, well, is. <laughs> or, or, or they, they they don't know who Pontiac is, right? And, and they don't know who and, and any of the the auto executives yeah. are, except for for Elon right now. It's it's a it's an incredible paradigm shift that we're talking about right now. And if we, we go back just a little bit further, when we talked about that, we also had a vast discovery of oil in Pennsylvania and then the Gulf um, the Gulf Coast. Uh, you know, right around the time when the the internal combustion engine became really uh, predominant, along with Kettering's, uh, incidentally, that was on a Cadillac. It, it was the yeah. Cadillac, which uh, a lot of people don't realize that Mr. Ford actually was the yeah. original. Used to be used to be called the Henry Ford. The company. Henry Ford Company. Yeah. And then uh, I think uh, they booted him they out. They booted him out. Yeah. And, Le- and Ford's uh, a great guy. It was Leland, right? Leland got him out. Well, Leland started uh, Lincoln and Cadillac. Yeah. Right. But it was Durant that. Oh, Durant. It might have been Durant. I, I don't oh, I can't remember. It's it was either to... Leland or Durant. But yeah. you know, Henry Ford uh, has a, a great mind, and he was uh, clearly uh, the guy that had really impacted the world in general. You know, he went from eight hundred and fifty dollars a, a vehicle in nineteen oh eight, and within ten years they were two hundred and fifty six bucks or something like yeah. that. Yeah, everybody could afford a Model T. Well, for me, the uh, Henry Ford. The first was the uh, was the was the Elon Musk of his day. I I I, I agree with that. Yeah, I, so, I do agree with that. So you know what's even more interesting is um, uh, I don't watch much TV, and when I do, <laughs> I don't watch cable. I just can't understand why it is. I can get the same crap off the aerial. So I uh, I'm not. Uh, you said um, aerial. Oh, so yeah, so I should say antenna. But anyways, uh, but, but, uh, but it, at the end of the day, um, I, I see car ads and tons of them. Ah, come on right in, big deal, you know. But you don't see anything on Tesla. And I see presidents banging on tables saying that GM is leading the way. And yet, for some reason or other, all these kids, somehow they cut through all this baloney and he goes straight back to Tesla, straight back to Elon Musk. Not, I haven't talked to one kid who knows who Mary Barra is. Not one of the kid, because I say, uh, so uh, do you know Elon Musk? Oh yeah, yeah, oh yeah. Oh, you're so lucky to have talked to him, blah, blah, blah. Do you know who Mary Barra is? No. Do you, she's in charge of GM. Oh. Yeah, Mary's got a tough job. Uh, Mary's, I have no clue she, she has what she's going to do, but I can tell you one thing for sure. Uh, we should stick with the history and keep out yeah. of that one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, sorry I diverged. That's but all right. anyway. That's all right. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the history of, of where we are, and, and there's a lot of parallelisms, again, is that when we talked about Henry Ford as an example, um, there was reluctance for Henry Ford. I'm sure you know all these things, but f- for the folks that are listening out there, it's, it's pretty interesting. Remember that Henry Ford had incorporated three, on three separate occasions earlier, before uh, uh, 1908. That's, that was the third time. And his investors were um, pretty prominent folks, by the way. You yeah. had uh, James Cousin yeah. and um, uh, the, the Dodge Brothers yeah. were the, the primary investors who owned, incidentally, 10% of the Ford Motor Company back then. Long, long story. I would. Highly recommend if you enjoy good reading is to read the Dodge, Dodge Dynasty or Henry Ford, the Man and His Machine. Yeah, uh, along those, uh, uh, it's great history. But what the Dodge brothers were trying to do, they were the largest supplier to Ford Motor Company. They made the engines, the transmissions, and the frames back then, along with multiple body uh, companies: Murray, uh, Bud Company, Briggs Body, and so on and so forth. My point is this. 
During that, that time from about 1908 to roughly 1916, 1917, excuse me, the, um, the, the Dodge brothers had made um, a lot of suggestions to Henry Ford to, in, to, to, to make the, the Model T better. And it was a great car. I mean, it was easy to fix. It was inexpensive. Uh, all the parts were available, so on and so forth. And Henry Ford kind of stuck, dug his heels in and said, nope, we're going to continue with the Model T. Well, what happened? You had Dodge Incorporated as a car company right around the, uh, you know, 1915, 1917. You had Billy Duran and Buick go out and essentially start a car company with newer, more slick models which actually, and that was, in, in, in some historians categorize that as one of Henry's bigger mistakes is not to, yeah. uh, not to go with the time, so to speak. And I think that's what you're referring to a little bit with what we're seeing right now is that we're a little bit late to the party and, um, and we've got to really hustle to catch up. And I, we, we can talk about that for hours, I'm sure. Yeah. But that was, a, that was a big deal. And, and Henry Ford didn't introduce the, the Model A um, until you know, somewhere around, uh, I can't remember the dates exactly, but somewhere in the 1925 yeah, or something. Right. Like that. By yeah, that time, Dodge was uh, had already uh, made a, a pretty good run at it, and then of course Durant and uh, Buell. Well, yeah, Oldsmobile. Another way we should we should say one thing. So this is something that history books kind of gloss over or don't tell you about at all. But Billy Durant was the guy who invented General Motors. He started off with Buick. Then he added Cadillac, and he added Pontiac, and he added Chevrolet. All these different things came together. And in essence, he felt that the only way that he could compete with Henry Ford was to have variety in mm -hmm. the models. And, uh, and so anyway, uh, then you've got Albert Sloan coming in. Albert Sloan got all the glory, uh, and basically he kicked Durant out and, um, and he added uh, a different flavor to how things were done. Um, and basically he invented the term built-in obsolescence among other things. Uh, <clears throat> and people still went for it. And he became kind of like a hero. And Billy Durant, um, he wound up uh, with bowling alleys or something As a matter in, of fact, uh, it's in a, Flint. Yeah, he yeah. did. He had a bowling alley. You died penalty, essentially next, penniless. Next but you got to give credit to Sloan. So um, um, in that time that we're talking about, but when Billy Durant was, uh, was essentially penniless, Sloan had actually pulled some of the auto guys together. Um, yeah, I can't remember. It might have been Walter Chrysler and so on and so forth. But uh, basically, we're sending Billy checks. Monthly. I did not know that. That's a, that's a, a well-known. Well, it, it's written in some of the history books that they were they actually uh, pulled money together and were sending him a check for he, to him and his wife. Hmm. So I read so uh, I read a, was, was, uh, what was a part of a diary um, that um, <clears throat> that either a contemporary or Billy Duran himself um, uh, put together and. Um, I didn't know he was penniless because the Durant house was real close to me. The original, or his house where he died, is quite large, and uh, it was on um, on the um, Bloomfield Township side of uh, of um, what's the name of that place? Hickory Grove. Okay. That's, and uh, they now it's. I mean, it's a whole bunch of really. Sp big fancy houses. Mm -hmm. But I believe in the, the roads called Durant that, uh, that drives around inside. Um, I thought he had money, but he was pretty much ostracized from the, uh, from the world because, you know, he had been classified as a failure. And being a failure in the auto world means basically you're cooked and once you're out, you're out forever. You can't, there's no second act and in the auto world, it's a tough, uh, tough road. Yeah, I think his, his, if I'm not mistaken, his first round at General Motors, the investors booted him out yeah, uh, because he had overextended his line of credit, essentially, hmm. with with uh, Oakland Motor, uh, and there was a slew of them that he had picked up. But then he ended yeah. up going back. So. Yeah, he went back and forth like uh, yeah. Steve Jobs uh, yeah. for a while. Until Sloan showed up, and well, you then know, Sloan did something else that was uh, uh, a good move. 
um, Henry the First was hard to work for, and so uh, the Bunny Newson or one of those Bunny guys, Newson, anyways, yeah. yeah, pulled them in over. And and Bunny was the guy that uh, that knew how to make assembly lines hum. And there yeah. you go. So did Walter Chrysler. Uh, Walter There's Chrysler, a brilliant guy yeah, right there. Yeah. Well, he was a tool maker like me. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. A lot so of those was Henry were, Ford. So yeah. was Henry Ford. Yeah. Almost all. So of were them. the Dodge brothers, by the way. They yes, invented they the, were. The, the enclosed ball bearing. Yep. And um, it's a. I mean, there's a great history there. But uh, you know, <clears throat> Sloan. We talk about Sloan for a little bit. I mean, there was. Uh, there's a brilliant guy. I mean, he's an MIT guy, um, and he 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 actually, in my opinion. Uh, he, he professionalized General Motors, is what he really did. There was processes in place on, on, uh, on the production level, things of that nature. And then people use this intentional obsolescent word, and I, I call it more like dynamic obsolescence because the cars, they lasted much longer than what people lead to, are led to believe, but that also uh entailed uh, starting a, a good used car market as well and he was actually one of the guys that had the in fact he was the the guy that that essentially came up with the trade-in um, and also um, worked with the banks and ultimately was gmac uh, in terms of being able to um, finance cars I mean, the guy mm. was brilliant absolutely brilliant and that's well. And everybody else followed suit. So Walter Chrysler, you have even AMC when you talk about, uh, and Nash, of course, uh, you know, Charles Nash and uh, George um, uh, Mason. Mm -hmm. So there's, everybody followed suit. But the interesting thing about that model right now, I'm not so sure that's... Uh, I think the model is dead. <laughs> I, I, I don't want to... Pussyfoot around on that one. I think that the the dealership, uh, like I was just looking at cranes, and they're talking about buying and selling dealerships. If I was into uh, buying or selling, it'd be selling. I'd be looking to get out because um, I heard uh, on this trip we had the trip with the Tesla Model uh, Plaid, uh, the Model S Plaid, and we went around and we went to Toronto. And one of the guys that came over to see us and whatnot, when we stopped to talk to the different Tesla groups, he, uh, <laughs> he started talking about how he had just quit his job. Now, this guy was selling 50 cars, I think, 50 cars a week or 50 cars. 50 cars is what I remember. And I don't remember, most people don't sell 50 cars in a year. This guy was selling them per month or per mm -hmm. week or something like that. He was their highest performer. He got sacked. Really? And he had two of his colleagues there with him. And I said, well, why did they sack you? Well, they didn't want to pay my uh, commission. And he started going into how Stellantis is trying to get out of uh, these different things. And when the dealership was told, okay, so no more of these extra bonuses and none of this and none of that, the incentive is going away quickly. Mm -hmm. So I think the inside track for Stellantis is to get rid of uh, dealerships, make it so that it just doesn't make any money to be in that business. And if that's the case, if the, what, he, what I was told at that uh, in Toronto, if that's the case, then holy mackerel, that's going to be a big change. And if Stellantis is in, in, in the lead there, mm -hmm. well, um, you know, there's the... Um, <clears throat> the old things about pioneers and settlers. <laughs> yeah. 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 Pioneer pioneers take a, a whole bunch of arrows. So yeah. there's there's bound to be some surprises there. But let's talk more sure. about let's move um, you know, fast forward a bit into where we are now. Um I I've uh, most of the audience has heard me talking at least um too many times <laughs> about um about what I think the future holds, but I'd, I'd be very interested in what you have to say. What do you think is going to happen in the next, I'll oh, cut it down here, two or three years and then five years? Where That's do you think everybody's question. going to be? And, um, you know, even uh, you know, Bob Lutz had mentioned in 2008, electric cars are here and, uh, and they're here to stay. And it is the future, uh, obviously. Um, and, and, and Rick Wagner had mentioned uh, after he had left General Motors that the biggest mistake that he made was canceling the EV1. 
So we, those are the things that we know, is that the, the electrification of vehicles, uh, much like we saw the internal combustion engine uh, take uh, precedence over um, all the rest of the other propulsion devices, including horses. And steam. And steam. Um, it, we'll see that uh, an absolute revolution in, in the electrification of vehicles. Um, uh, the other thing is that, uh, you know, I did a little bit of work with um, the G company, Google, some time ago uh, on their, their autonomous car. Um, and I have to tell you that, uh, it, it, here's, here's my opinion, uh, is that we have, we have a tremendous amount, is, we're talking about the auto history, but we have amassed an incredible uh, industry of some of the most brilliant human beings that have ever existed in all time. And we're, we're to the point where our, our battery cost per kilowatt hour is going down for one. And the, the driverless vehicles that are, that are being developed right now, it is clearly just a matter of time. And, and there's a couple of things that I'd like to mention about uh, autonomous cars or driverless cars. If we can, if we can, we, we almost owe it to society to do what we're doing right now with the electrical ve electric vehicles. And more importantly is, is the autonomous car and driverless cars because we lose nearly 40,000 lives a year in the United States alone. Mm -hmm. And trillions and trillions of dollars of health care of people that are injured in cars. And if we can curtail that in any way, shape or form, or if we don't, shame on us as engineers and scientists and and people that build these cars and, and research these things. We, we actually owe it uh, to society in many respects. I mean, do the math. If we were, if we were 40,000 people a year is two 747s dropping out of the sky every week. Don't you think the FAA would do something about that? And we have yeah. the ability to do that. So that's the first part of the answer is that electrification is here. I, I also see um, that, you know, we were talking about uh, uh, Sloan as an example on the dynamic um, obsolescence, obsolescence of vehicles. I, I'm not the one that coined that phrase. I just happen to like dynamic obsolescence. I, I think we see it, we're seeing, for sure, start, starting to see that go away. You know, the younger folks um, are more interested in well, not really, because oh, for, from a styling standpoint, for sure. Yes. But dynamic obsolescence now is, what are those cool new features? Absolutely. It it hasn't gone away. I think it's just just different. transposed. It's been it's been superimposed with something else. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, you remember when we were younger, there was a great song out there by Ronnie <clears> and the Daytonas. It was, um, I'm going to save all my money and buy a GTO, right? Yes. Okay. I started singing that, but I had a lot of. Uh, you got somehow you got yeah, criticized. Yeah, I got criticized. Yeah, so I'll go I ahead and take a it. crack at it. <laughs> anyway, I'm gonna save all my money and I a GTO, buy a helmet and a roll bar, and I'll be ready to go. Yeah. On and on. Yeah. So anyway, three there you deuces go. and a four speed and a yeah. three eighty nine. Yeah, exactly. So in any event, so we we're now conditioned. Uh, not to save our money and buy a GTO. No. We're, we, it is, it, it, we're in this, uh, more of a service. And I, I think, um, um, uh, you know, Farley has mentioned it a number of times, changing to a service organization. Yeah. And, and you couldn't be further from the, I mean, it is absolutely, absolutely the truth. So transportation is a service, um, uh, vehicle, um, um, I'm trying to think of the terminology. Well, it's almost like your Airbnb, right? So yeah. all that will become, you know, and I also believe that um, we will see um, larger purchases because of our, our ownership model will likely go away over the next 10 years. Well, here's what I think, okay? Because I don't want, I want to make sure that I, I make one comment that I think okay. that'll make uh, the dealerships happy. Dealerships are either going to disappear like dinosaurs, or they're gonna grow feathers like birds 
used to be dinosaurs, grow feathers and fly. And here's how they can do it. They move from selling cars to renting cars. And if they do that, they already know the industry and stuff like, if they do that, they're gonna be in like Flint. But if they don't, they're, they're just, gonna, just gonna wind up like the dinosaurs um, stuck in the mud or, uh, or, uh, or some kind of footnote yeah. in history. <clears throat> so that, that's, my, uh, that's my long and short answer, I guess. I could, we could talk about it for a long, long time. But well, actually, is, I was kind of hoping, well, who do you think the winners and losers are gonna be? The obvious <laughs> being Tesla. We, we're not gonna talk about that. Who's, who else you know, is out there? I, I, it, it, you know, because I, I, I really don't know what the in, internal plans of Ford and General Motors are and Stellantis, it's, it's really difficult for me to see. But uh, on the outside, it, it's, it's, um, it's uh, all indications are is that there'll, there'll be some survivors and not survivors. But um, uh, who, who, who gets to the finish line first with, with the right models at the right time? The unfortunate thing about our legacy manufacturers is, is that's, that's what they are, is they're legacy manufacturers. They have, still have a, a fair bit of debt um, and uh, the new guys don't. The, they also carry a lot of legacy costs, the new guys don't. Um, there's technology that, um, that is out there that I think that really needs to be incorporated across the board uh, to uh, the legacy guys and of course, what the, the new folks are doing. So, I, well, I, I was, I'm kind of curious. New folks. So we know about Tesla. I, I was kind of hoping you might give us some hints on who you think is going to fill the void. What uh, uh, what I would classify as the valley of death, where people want electric cars, can't get them. Who's going to fill up that void? Which car companies? And it isn't going to be Ford, Chrysler, or General Motors. They can't possibly. They, they've already said it, they can't ramp up fast enough. So who do you think is gonna move into, and Toyota? Toyota's also in there. Let me answer it this way. Let me use some, you're, you're a guy with data, right? And I, we're all engineers, I think, all of us in here. And uh, the data shows that um, our, our Chinese brethren uh, are outproducing uh, us at a rapid rate with regard to electric vehicles, which tells me I'm going to tell you a quick little story, and, and hopefully the rest of the folks out there enjoy the story. In 1990, I was, invent, I was invited to a symposium in Chicago with a fellow by the name of Don St. Pierre. It may ring a bell to you. It does, but I can't okay. remember. And his, his counterpart was a fellow by the name of Chen Ju Lin. Yeah, I know him. <clears throat> okay. okay. Uh, Don St. Pierre was the president of Beijing Jeep. Beijing Jeep incorporated in 1984. That's a long time ago. Yeah. So I went to the symposium. There was about five or ten U.S. executives, including myself. I was running Entech at the time. And um, about 60 or 70 U.S. lawyers. Uh, and their primary function was, uh, was merger and acquisitions and also intellectual property law. So I really didn't know what I was in store for. Uh, uh, Don St. Pierre was the, was the keynote speaker of that event. And it was about intellectual property and there was about 200, maybe even more Chinese auto people. Now China's been making cars for a while. They've been mm -hmm. making them since about 1955 or something like that. Japanese started mass producing in about 1930 or somewhere in there as well. But by and large, over the last 10 to 12 years, let me finish the story first. So when, when I got back to Detroit, I thought, well, that's interesting. Uh, the Chinese uh, want to build cars for themselves. They have a very, uh, their population is growing. They need to, uh, they're not going to buy them from the outside, so they're going to make their own. About 10 years later, I thought, well, they want to make them for everybody. And that's exactly what we're talking about right now. Yeah. And for the last 10 to 12 years, they have concentrated uh, their energy. I mean, they, they make 95% of all electric buses on the face of the planet right now. Right. Pretty staggering numbers. 
That, last time I checked, they made 13 million vehicles uh, last year or something like that. No, maybe even more than that. 18 it's more million. than that. 18, 18 million. million. Yeah. The vast majority of those are electric. Yeah. So. 37, uh, I think it's, it's 30 something percent, they said, uh, will we'll, we'll be electric vehicles. Now, when we talk about electric vehicles, too, you have to be very careful that people aren't thinking that this is going to be like a Tesla Model 3 or something like that. These are all kinds of vehicles, delivery trucks, um, three-wheeled, uh, you know, uh, 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 what do you call them, motorized rickshaws and things sure. like that. So there's a lot of other stuff that we would classify as golf cars and things, not, not something that you'd see on the road that you see on the road in China based on where they are. If, if you're in the city and whatnot, you can't have a diesel engine. It just doesn't work uh, for delivery trucks. You have to have <clears throat> you have to have a, uh, a diesel or uh, gas engine. You have to have some other last mile delivery system that that's mm -hmm. going to be running on electric uh, on electricity. Yeah, Absolutely. So, I mean, look at BYD. I mean, if, if you, you look go. at their if you look at what they have in terms of their Dolphin, their Dolphin vehicle is uh, you know slightly larger than a Mini. Um, it's absolutely, well, I haven't driven one, but um, um, all the reports are is that it's an absolutely fabulous vehicle. Well, I think that BYD is going to be owning um, about a third of the market. That's where I think it's, uh, it's going to wind up. Um, I, think, uh, I think that there's going to be a tremendous number of other uh, Chinese vehicle companies that are going to be scrambling in there. And I believe that somewhere along the line, at the end, uh, the, the Chinese are going to probably wind up with about 50% market share, imported 50% market oh, share. It happened to BYD, us in the 1970s. what's that? It happened to it, us in the 70s. Exactly right, and and that's it was where. Twice. I and and quite frankly, this is where <clears throat> um, history repeats itself over and over again. When the Japanese started bringing over the car that people wanted, people did not want a road hugging. Uh, Ford put that thing a road hugging V8. That that is not uh, that's not what you you want to have. Everybody wanted something that was going to be able to be a sipper, right? They wanted just a little bit of gas to go a long way, and now we're into no gas whatsoever, and getting caught flat-footed seems to be kind of the hallmark of uh, of uh, a lot of car companies around here. Tomorrow is just a dim reflection of today. That's not going to happen at all. It's not going to happen at all. So I see BY, I see <clears throat> BYD, FAW, Beijing Automotive. Um, Geely already has uh, cars on the market. Oh, the the Polestar. Uh, the Polestar is out there. I see a lot of things happening really, really quickly. And I just wonder if they can move fast enough, um, that uh, the hometown team can move half fast enough to make something happen. They keep saying 2025, 2027, 2028. Are you kidding me? By the time you catch up, uh, the race is over. It's gone. Yeah, 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 along the same lines. Of course, I'm, 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 I'm proud of the industry that we're in, and I, and I have a lot of respect for General Motors Ford and Stellantis and Chrysler. I mean, you know, my dad started at Chrysler in 53 with Briggs Body. So I have a lot of respect for the, the folks at GM, Ford, and Chrysler and across the board. And uh, I, like you, um, uh, hope that the guys pull a rabbit out of their hat because, you know, uh, what we talk about, let me, let me just say something to the folks that are listening out there. I've known Sandy for an awful long time. And, and I know where his heart is. I, I, I know that he's not the prophet of doom. He's doing this for reasons. Um, and that's to alert people where, where the market is going so that there's some folks that actually listen. And, and I hope and pray that we actually pull something out of the hat. Well, but on the other hand, we have a lot of competition and, um, and it's gonna to be tough. Well, they're not sitting on their hands. And by the way, boys and girls, um, this is my card right here. And what does it say? CEO of Monroe & Associates, and design profit, as in seeing the future. It's been my job for a long, long time to tell people what the future is, and I've been right 
a lot, uh, a lot more enough so that people get annoyed at me telling them, yeah, 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 I told you so. And I intend to keep doing that. And one of the things that I want to do is, um, because we have to kind of like wrap it up, what I want to do is I want to bring Al outside and show him the new little electric car that we just got, and we bought it for $35,000. And I want you to see what this has. Okay, so Al and I are standing in front of the, um, the little car we just bought. And Al, I'd like you to tell me what you think. Look at the gaps, look at the paint, open the doors, do whatever you like. Okay. And tell me what you think. Looks like we taught him well. Uh, actually, you'd be surprised. Yeah, nice to cheat the fender out where it belongs. Yeah. <laughs> Get in. quiet tracks. Oh, by the way, um, Al, uh, Al works in seating, so um, he knows about stuff. I've been all over these doggone cars, let me tell you, so. The typical uh, automotive guy starts picking away, right? Well, we've been uh, picking away at almost every one of the cars that's come in, and quite frankly, for the price, and the range and uh, the performance characteristics of this thing. Holy mackerel. Think of this as, uh, you know, a comparison to the Bolt, the Chevy Bolt. And um, I mean, we don't even have the Bolt body around here anymore. We got rid of it because there was nothing, nothing that, uh, that, that, that pointed mm -hmm. out any way. So anyway, I want you to try something else. I want you to have a, a try of this back seat. Um, okay, I'm gonna throw this back a little bit then. Well, that's fine. Okay. I think you're gonna get a surprise. First off, look at the size of that door. Yeah. It's 45 inches long. I, I've never done a door that big. But anyway, when you open it up and you look at grandma, you know, um, Oh, wow. Getting in there, yeah. I can see they stuff it back behind, behind the uh, AB line. I got that seat all the way back. Yeah. I did that on purpose. Well, like I said, you can do that. Oh, and by the way, what do you think of those floor mats? They're pretty... <laughs> <laughs> So most of the most of the gals here are saying that it looks it looks similar to the inside of a lady's purse. I mean, yeah. I have no idea how much that costs to do all of that. Is that all stitched in there? It is. No kidding. It's all stitched. I mean, there's nothing. Uh... And by the oh, way, that's the whole the, back that's thing not is just the mail that comes all the way up the top. Oh, yeah, that's clever. How are the NVH qualities? It's as quiet as a tomb. Really? Really. Do you have any idea what the uh, first mode is on the... Uh... Not yet. No, we haven't tested it out. We only had it for a couple, three days. Yeah, this... This thing's got every bell and whistle imaginable yeah. on it. These are uh, not leather, which is good. Yeah. Nice grain. Yeah, nice everything. I don't know who taught these guys, but they did a good job. <laughs> anyway, have a look at the um, at the, this deck lid and uh, storage. The seats do not fold flat, but um, and look, more of that stuff. I'll be darned. <laughs> nice leftover. Yeah, I love it. I think it looks great. Plus you can pull it out, that all that stuff out. And now you've got a, I get a second trunk well. 
didn't have any uh, AC outlets back here. Uh, they're all in the front. Okay. That's one thing I liked about the, the Dolphin, the BYD. You can actually plug your accessories right into the port. Yeah, you can, yeah. You can do that here as well. But you know what? The, the VW ID4 does not have that feature and it costs more money. Wow. Are you going to, what's your plans with this? Are you going to, uh, we're going to drive it around it, a while and, and then, then take, take it apart. apart. Yeah. It's got a low floor. Yeah. It's fabulous for getting in and out of, I mean, there's virtually no, uh, so is that why the, no problem the seat, where's the battery? The battery, battery is below the floor. There's nothing, uh, nothing up here. Oh, That's it's down it, there. Okay, I got it. Yeah. Couldn't reach around. Yeah, it's, it's so pretty impressive. this thing right here reminded me of when I saw the first Lexus that 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 Ford and GM and everybody else said VW BMW they all said the same thing. Oh. They'll never the Japanese will never be able to figure out how to make a luxury car. And I got into that thing and I could not believe my eyes. I couldn't believe that all these things were happening right in front of my eyes. Yeah. And the GM guys, because I was at GM at the time as a consultant, they were looking at it and going, oh, this thing's impossible. We have to sue these guys because there's no way they could build this, this car for this price. There's no chance or blah, 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 on and on and on. But, um, and they did take a shot at it, but it didn't work out. And well, I'll tell you, I, everybody kind of like collapsed. I remember when they announced that the, the first Lexus at the Detroit Auto Show. I remember where it was placed. I remember what it looked like. At the time, uh, it, it, those were my Antec days. We were yeah. doing an awful lot of work with Cadillac. Um, and it was, a, it was a realization for the Cadillac guys back then. Yeah. And Cadillac, you know, they, they did a great job on that. Uh, it was a four-door hardtop. Uh, yeah, Seville, right. which is a pretty difficult thing to do, hard top anything. Yeah. But uh, that was uh, staggering for a lot of people. When well, I, I can I can tell you that when I looked at the uh, when I looked at that car, it, it still had the paint on it and things like that. It was still in one piece, and I put my hands around it and I said, the only way to make this car is with uh, Taylor welded blanks mm -hmm. and. Oh, no, that's just a, what did they call it? A professor's wet dream. That's what Taylor Walden blanks. Taylor Walden blanks. There was no way that we were going to be putting them into the Cadillac because I was working for Cadillac yeah. at the time. And when we we got done a little bit and I said, I, I asked one of the guys, go get me some paint remover, real paint remover, MEK mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And I put it in there and we found and then they saw the joint. Yeah. You couldn't see the joint like you couldn't feel it. It was really well done. And when they saw the weld joints, I'm telling you what, there was a lot of people either backpedaling or real quiet. Yeah. This car, this car, <clears> I <throat> think is going to be something similar to that. There's going to be a lot of guys going, this is coming from a little dinky company I never heard of before. Uh, Imperium is uh, totally a, a new mystery to me. I never worked with these guys when I was in China, but by the same token, we were doing uh, like how to design cars. Uh, we, were, we were doing workshops like that, two weeks at a crack, three weeks mm -hmm. at a crack. And there was hundreds of people out there, hundreds of people in the audience, all diligently taking notes and sure. going through all the little uh, exercises and whatnot and coming up with yeah. designs on parts that they brought themselves. Uh, this looks to me like, uh, <laughs> I mean, I look at this and I see minimal parts. I see parts that I described to say, I like these parts or I like that part. 
Um, I like these kinds of fasteners. I like that kind of fasteners. And so far, everything that I've said is in this vehicle. I, I don't know, like I say, I don't know any about, I, don't, I know almost nothing about it. The only reason I bought it was because it was at the LA Auto Show. And, uh, and it's the first Chinese car I saw come over that isn't gonna cost me 200 grand. Was this the one that was when you walked through the front door? Right. Okay. Yeah, it was right on the left hand side. Yeah. 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 So I bought one of them, but they had a step van. They mm -hmm. had um, smaller, a, a vehicle smaller than this. They've got a whole line of cars. They're all ready to go and they're selling them and they're bringing them in through Canada. Okay. And then selling them yeah. here in the States. So that gets around a, a lot of issues. Um, but I'm telling you, this you know, to me, Sandy, when you, when you start to talk about those things, I, 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 I reminisce quite a bit because of, you know, I, I enjoy the history of the auto industry, but all the things that you mentioned in terms of stamping, tailored welded blanks, deep draw stampings, prog dies, and all the, we practically invented all of that stuff here. We did invent it here, but we gave it away yeah. continuously. Who invented the CNC machine? It was but right here on them? Grossbeck. Exactly right. <laughs> right on Grossbeck. And who gave it away? Who didn't want to invest? No, no, no way. We we're going to spend any money. That would cost us money. We got to save money. In fact, one of my one of my key things is don't save me any money. I can't afford can't it. Can't afford it. That's right here at Monroe and Associates. And you know what? Everybody else has gone out of business or gone bankrupt or, or thereabouts. Yeah. We haven't. And I intend to keep it that way. So, um, uh, so I'm, I'm looking at this and going, uh, I'm staring at the future. This is the future. And there's plenty more like where this came from. Like I say, I never even met these guys. And this car is ready for prime time right now. That's beautiful. A couple of things I don't like. I don't like those rotors and whatnot but you know what at the end of the day for the price i'll take it i'll take it all day long yeah so anyway I'll, we yeah, gotta wrap uh, it up and um i'd like to thank you for coming by well uh, it's always and, a pleasure and bringing that red that red sweater well every, i had to see my uh yeah your christmas outfit my yeah christmas regalia Woohoo! <laughs> so uh but anyways thanks for coming by and uh and uh, uh to those who are viewing Thanks for sticking around. This has been a long one. Uh, yeah. I hope you enjoyed it. Keep watching. Thank you very much. Hey, thanks a lot. Bye now.